Our next speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Taylor. Dr. Taylor is the technical lead for WHO in the Tripartite Joint Secretariat for AMR, supporting the collaboration between FAO, OIE, UNEP, and WHO at global, regional, and country levels. She has led the development of the tripartite strategy and development of the AMR multi-partner trust fund. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. We are keen to hear from you about the importance of the tripartite partnership and the One Health approach. Over to you. Good morning and good afternoon, participants. Um, and it's great to talk to you. Uh, I'm going to share some slides, which I hope will complement the messages that uh, highly shared. Uh, I will try and go quickly so that there is more time for discussion. Um, but let me start anyway straight away. Um, so I think the host has disabled participant screen sharing. I get a message. So perhaps I, if I can be allowed to share my screen, that would be great. Yes, um, you can use that screen share button, which you must be seeing, and then you'll be able to share it. Uh, I get host, when I pass share screen, I get host disabled participant screen screen sharing. Um, so I maybe change that, or I could send this presentation to Thomas, and Thomas could perhaps share it for me. Would that be possible? Sure, 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 Liz. If you can send it to me, Doctor Paulin, can you try one more time, please? Yeah, try one Dr. more Paulin. time, Doctor. Please okay. try one more time. Try one oh, more time. Marvelous. You've done whatever you've done. You've worked some magic. Uh, and it seems to be working. So that is great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and can we share my... Can you see my screen yet? No. What are we doing now? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. So what I'm going to do, uh, it's a sort of global overview, focusing particularly on the One Health aspects that highly built, and then talking a little bit about how, at a global and a country level, we work together with the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Organization for Animal Health, and increasingly with the um, United Nations Environment Programme. So. This is a slight, similar slide to the one Haile actually showed, but it's worth reiterating that AMR is a complex problem. As Thomas said, humans are abusing antibiotics, but we've been abusing them not only in the human health sector, but in fish farming, in animal farming, uh, in producing livestock uh, and treating in animals who are sick. We have inadequate water and sanitation with discharge of antimicrobials into water and increasingly antibiotics have even been used and sprayed on crops. And all of this, the more we use antibiotics in any sector, the greater the chance that resistance will develop and that these drugs will become uh, ineffective. So in the human sector, one of the issues is that antibiotics are used as a substitute for having decent infrastructure, for decent hygiene measures, and for proper diagnosis and treatment. Um, over 30% of health facilities don't have running water or a clean toilet. So it's very difficult to practice good hygiene in those environments. So antibiotics are used as a cheaper substitute. This is an issue in the developing world, but it is also as much an issue in developed countries where there is still very widespread um, use of antibiotics in the prevention of, of, of infection and in treating infections that don't respond. Things like flu, where antibiotics don't work, but they're still being used. We were talking about over-the-counter sales, and this, again, is a big risk when this, this poor person is, is, is buying antibiotics from a market stall and neither he nor the vendor are aware of how these drugs should be used and they may well be of a lower quality. This is a problem in the human sector, but it's as much a problem in the animal sector where there is a big push to intensify agriculture, intensify livestock production, very often in unsanitary facilities, 
with poor biosecurity. And so a lot of antibiotics are used uh, to prevent infections. Or if there's a small risk of an infection in a herd, the whole herd will be treated. Antibiotics in many countries are still also being used to promote growth in animals. So in many countries, more antibiotics is being fed to healthy animals than to sick humans or sick animals. But it's not just humans and animals. One of the things we're becoming increasingly aware of is that antibiotics are actually being used uh, in the production of food, uh, sprayed large amounts, sprayed on orange trees in California. Streptomycin, a drug very important for TB, infectiocyte, sprayed on crop production, used in rice production. Antifungals have been used to treat flowers, and that's been linked to the development of resistance in humans. So across the board, we have a problem with antibiotics being used in, in, in food and, and, and health, human health. And one of the problems is that this then leaches into the environment, into the rivers. We have antibiotics residues as a waste product of food production, washing off fields, washing off from animal production and from hospitals, and all ending up in the water supply where people are bathing, where they are getting their drinking water. Very often there are high levels of, of bacteria in these waters as well, if there's inadequate sanitation. So that's a pretty toxic soup in which resistance bacteria will develop, thrive, and be transmitted. And a lot of the time we're talking about this as though it's a problem of Europe and developed countries. And in those countries, there are sufficient infrastructure and sufficient labs to actually detect this and get a good idea of the scale of the problem. But increasingly, we are realizing that the biggest burden of infection is in Africa, in Asia, in lower middle income countries. And almost certainly the biggest burden of resistance is occurring in those countries. And these are the countries whose health systems are least resilient, least able to deal with untreatable infections or infections that will become much more expensive and difficult to treat. So this is a real crisis globally but particularly for low and middle income countries. So politically, there was a global action plan developed in 2015 by WHO. And at that stage, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, also endorsed that plan. And in 2016, it was taken to the UN General Assembly uh, where heads of state said, we need to work together. We need a one health approach. We need to take this forward. And since then, there has been intensified uh, collaboration across sectors to work out what we do and how we take things forward. Um, there was an interagency coordination group that provided a report. And even through the pandemic, one of the first hybrid meetings in the UN happened in April this year with a high level dialogue on AMR, signed up by 110 countries that we must continue to take action. And we as WHO work very closely with the Food and Agriculture Organization, who looks after food production, the food sector, the Organization of Animal Health that works with the veterinary sector, and increasingly with the United Nations Environment Program to coordinate action uh, and also support global governance structures. Each sector needs to be strong. So FAO will work with the agricultural ministries, provide technical support to the food sector, uh, and, and similarly, OIE with the vets. So we need strong sectors that coming together with a one health approach to coordinate uh, and get a better overview of the system. We now have a fantastic uh, global leaders group, uh, which is chaired by Prime Minister of Barbados, Mir Motti, and the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, and has leaders from across sectors, and across regions, you can see the very diverse geographic spread and the heads of the four agencies to really keep the political flame alive, to drive this politically uh, and to push the agenda forward. We're in the process of developing a, a multi-stakeholder partnership platform 
which will allow civil society, academia, the private sector to come together to debate, to drive the agenda forward. Um, we were, one of the big things in development is of course the sustainable development goals. And there are now two indicators uh, around the, the SDG indicator framework. They're both in the human health space, but we can only achieve those by working across the SDGs in water and sanitation, sustainable production, partnerships, poverty, economic growth. But of course, the key thing really is to have action at country level. Global catalysis, providing the norms and standards and everything is really important. But at country level, each country committed to develop their own national action plan. They need to be multi-sectoral. They need to look across those sectors and strengthen all the sectors. And it is very encouraging that countries are developing their plans. They're starting to implement them, but there's still a major challenge that they're not yet in many places implemented at scale. And resourcing and getting these things into plans and budgets is a major change. It's really important that we mirror this collaboration between sectors at country level. So all countries are encouraged to develop their own multi-sectoral coordination groups. And there is progress on that and substantial progress over the last five years, but we still got a long way to go. And in many countries, those exist on paper, but are not really going forward uh, in practice and, and really functional and active. And that's another key area. So how do we ensure that these precious drugs are being used more, more, more effectively? Well, regulation is really important. And Thomas and Haile have both talked about the importance of stopping over-the-counter sales. And in many countries, most countries, 91% of countries in the world, there is regulation about this. The challenge then is implementation. Um, there is, uh, most countries regulate sales of antimicrobials for animal use, over almost two thirds have banned their use for growth promotion. Um, but so we're getting there, but then the challenge will be taking this into practice. So I said I'd be as quick as possible. And so to sum up, um, we need to do more. We're building the systems across the sectors to address AMR. We're starting to get good coordination mechanisms, but we're not going to scale fast enough. Um, We've got some political interest, we need more, and you are critical advocates in getting that message across, helping us to shift this from something that scientists talk about in drugs and bugs with long names into a message that is meaningful for everybody and, and really makes people think and act. And then we need to get more money uh, into these plans so that they can really go to scale. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Taylor, and thank you for really emphasizing on that one health concept that either we live together or we perish together. <laughs> so I, that, that I think we need to keep in mind. Uh, and participants, please send your questions for Dr. Taylor. We already have a few questions uh, for you. Uh, Rita Vidyadana, a very senior journalist from Jakarta, Indonesia. She wants to know how the current climate change issues are affecting AMR and health conditions of human animals and plants, given the challenging extreme environmental conditions, which certainly worsens infectious diseases. Yes, thank you very much. And this is a really good question. And if you want a detailed brief on this, the global leaders are actually publishing a brief on this. Um, but you're absolutely right. Climate change is causing changes in disease patterns. Um, and it's across the board. We see it a lot with malaria, but with other diseases as well. Uh, and we have adverse events that cause things like cholera, typhoid, other things. And that increase in bugs will make, and will be more resistance. And so people, many more vulnerable populations are gonna be exposed to those and it will make things significantly worse. And also the disruption that we get from those weather events and everything else, and the people movements that will be happening will all put extra pressure on the system uh, and resistance will compound that. Okay, thank you. Uh, just adding on to that, you talk of the adverse effects which are uh, increasing uh, antimicrobial resistance. 
There's a question from Dr. Tin Wong uh, Thwe, editor of Health Digester from Myanmar. And he says, what countries like Myanmar, which are in difficult situ political situations and other con similar countries, how do they deal with this growing menace of AMR? Because there the problems become a little different. They do, and it, but it is just as important. And we need to really focus on the basics. So in Myanmar, in fragile states, in low resource states, let's focus on getting immunization levels up, getting, focusing on water supply or hand hygiene and the basics, because that's important for public health anyway. Right. In the animal sector, again, try and ensure basic uh, infection prevention. Uh, and then for the antibiotics we have, we should focus on getting good access to the first line antibiotics, we call them access. Those are the categories that you will need in Myanmar for children with pneumonia. Make sure they have amoxicillin, the basics. But we don't want them, those countries to be spreading and using widely the watch and reserve, those that we want to keep in the second line. So it's keeping it simple, focusing on the basics, focusing on first line treatment of infection. Um, but but it is a challenge, particularly in fragile and complex states, and just knowing what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Wali Heather from Pakistan wants to know that here in Pakistan, faith-based healers and other med medical disciplines use medicines which are not much regulated. Also, contents of the medicine are not known so publicly, traditional wisdom, knowledge, etc. Is it contributing to AMR also? I know this is a difficult one, and I think certainly there is a risk when antibiotics, and we don't know what antibiotics or what quality, are just added into a mixture. Right. And that certainly is a bad thing. But faith-based medicine and people treating people with non-pharmacological treatment may be a very good thing. People with flu and who other non-bacterial infections, actually having somebody who provides treatment, provides care, supports them uh, if they're not using antibiotics uh, that's a great thing it would be perhaps you know for flus for colds and everything else that's a, a, a great treatment um, but please don't add in a little bit of this and antibiotics and cook and you you know putting antibiotics into your mixture is very very unhealthy. Thank you. Uh, a question from Asela Amarasiri uh, correspondent from Sri Lanka are globe trotters increasing the spread of AMR? Yes, probably. <laughs> uh, and certainly there was a fascinating study whereby the prevalence of antibiotic of resistance in different countries was tracked by looking at airline toilets. And all the planes coming into Schiphol, you could see where they'd come from by the um, bacteria in the feces in the toilets. So there is a spread. And I mean, this is why it's a global threat global threat because resistance spreads very quickly um, whether it is through globe trotters and travel and tourists whether it's the spread of food and livestock um, we need to be very aware that when a bug develops a resistance strain develops in one country it spreads around the world within two or three years okay uh, one last question for you dr taylor this is from Catherine from Zimbabwe. Uh, a similar question perhaps had been asked earlier. In Zimbabwe, antibiotics are a prescription drug. However, misuse still finds its way. We are not well resourced to afford running tests to see drugs work for patients at public institutions. I collect my ART from a funded center where treatment and service is comprehensive. Tests are run. I now know that I'm resistant to amoxicillin, penicillin, cotrimal, Marxazole. I have never misused antibiotics. So can resistant build even when there's not one does not misuse antibiotics? Yes, because actually, we just need a bit of a correction and a misapprehension here. You are not resistant to amoxicillin and tetracycline yeah. and penicillin. The bugs, the bacteria that you have for that particular infection are. So and, and this is something that is, is, is important to be aware, that it is the bacteria that become resistant and then spread. 
So it is very possible for people who have never taken uh, antibiotics or certainly who've never abused antibiotics to develop, to, to catch strains that are resistant. Okay. Um, in terms of, of, of diagnosis and, and doing sensitivity testing, this is an issue. And in primary and most hospitals around the world, uh, we will not do sensitivity testing routinely because it is much more expensive. So that's why we have guidelines of these are the drugs that should work in this instance, uh, and you should be adhering to those guidelines. Um, and, and that's how we take it forward. Okay. And Thank that's you, why we do surveillance to try and work yes, out what the resistance yes, patterns yes, are. Yes, yes, right, right. Thank you very much. And uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Thomas once again for his comments. And uh, there is a question for you also. So first your comment, please. Thank you very much, Shobha. I'm very happy to give comments. I'm not very sure if I'm able to answer questions. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but but, but yeah. just to say, first of all, a very warm thanks to Liz, who you know came on very short notice, and for her tremendous expertise and understanding and knowledge which she has shared. I think that's really useful. And somebody asked, you know, a question in the chat about what would you want the media to do? Exactly. And, uh, Can I interrupt? I was going to ask you that question only. <laughs> ah, okay, so then I'm happy to answer that yes, question. Yeah, that was the question. Because, because actually media can do a lot. And it is actually quite critical that media does a lot. Uh, antimicrobial resistance is poorly understood, very poorly understood. And I think Liz has now brought out the issues that uh, really must sink in, that these are integrative across one health. So whether you're dealing with animal health, plant health, the environment, or human health, antimicrobial resistance is a key issue and the drivers can be found in misuse and overuse and other factors, all of which are driven by, or most of which are driven by human beings themselves. And so the agency is that of our agency, us as humans, and we have a responsibility to change things. Take the issue of growth promotion, antibiotic use to increase the weight of animals and to you know, make them better sales at markets. Is this okay? No, it's not. We've got to stop it. How do we stop it? We've got to get consumers to be able to distinguish between meat that is antibiotic-free and meat that is that has used antibiotics for growth, growth promotion, and with their cash, say, no, we won't buy this. And this will happen and is happening, but it can be fueled by the media highlighting the issue, taking it to the public and say, it's your choice. What sort of meat do you want to eat? antibiotic-free or with antibiotics. So there are a host of issues, you know, antibiotics being used for prophylaxis, you know, to prevent disease before they even start, you know, is this okay? It's not done by the animals, it's done by the humans, right? So the media has a tremendous role to really bring these core messages. I think the last one was very important that we are not the ones as humans who are resistant. It is the bacteria within us and these can travel across borders easily. It's not just globe trotters. Anyone who travels can carry a resistant bacteria, and then that can spread within the population. So it's serious. How can we stop it? Can we educate the public in a way that is simple, effective? And you know, we stand ready to give you fact sheets, data, links, and so on, but ultimately to convert it into the language that can be easily understood by the public is your task. And I really invite you to do that during this week in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much.